Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 0363659 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. I'd like to thank the Lord tonight for where he has now brought us and we are going to be now looking at the active faith to walk under the open heavens. I didn't just want to use the word faith to walk under the open heavens, I want to quantify it as an active faith. Faith that is in action. Faith that is not passive. Faith that is responding because of what God has said. Faith that will hang on in the place of prayer simply because we are holding God to what he says. And I would like again to start from our thematic text, the theme text that we have been dealing with, John chapter 1 and verse 51. You know, yesterday I spent time looking at the hereafter and the implication of that year after and what God will have us do as we take our position in the place of prayer. But this afternoon, I would like you to return to that passage as we begin to look at what is the active faith that is required for us to walk under these open heavens. And we're going to check all the people that acted in their faith that turned what could have been ordinary onto an overwhelming move of God. And I'm believing that God himself will undertake for us in the name of Jesus Christ. And he says unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Hereafter, you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of of man. Immediately after that declaration, we enter into chapter 2 and it appears as if chapter 2 was like a foretaste of what will be happening. So you will allow me to read that chapter 2 not because I am particularly interested in that particular miracle, but because it gave a very critical, active faith to enact the open heavens that God is talking about. I would like to begin from that point, and then I'll trust God to move us uh, further. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee 
and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, when they lacked wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. I want you all to please pay attention to the word of God tonight. I perceive the Lord wants to lead us unto the kind of active faith that will cause us to walk under this open heaven and experience it and perpetuate it and grow in it. And I found this passage giving me a very simple, clear outline. And I'm praying that God will help each one of us in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible said, when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus says to her, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. His mother says unto the servants, whatsoever he says unto you, what? Do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three fuckings apiece. Newer version will tell you the number of gallons. Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they fill them up to the brim. And he says unto them, draw out now. And bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. And knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Let me stop there. May God uh, give us enlightenment as we go on quickly tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, a declaration was made. Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That declaration, we have said it over and over again. We have read it over and over again. But chapter 2, said, and the third day, why did they count the third day now? That means that they are counting the days from, <laughs> if you have been reading that chapter one, you will have seen them say, again the next day. Abi, in verse 35, again the next day. In Chapter, 40, chapter 1, verse 43. And the day following. I don't really understand it now. And then we came to chapter 2. What did they say now? The third day. Is it chronological? Eh? Oh my God. Is it? Is it following the chronology? All right. So which means when Jesus made this declaration, 
there was a context in which it began to happen. When God speaks a word of prophecy and he has made a declaration, there is a context in which it may begin. So what I'm describing here is the beginning. Hallelujah. And every reviver must have what? A beginning. There will be always a beginning. When we read Psalms of Solomon chapter 2, I think I referred to it again yesterday. Let me ask you to read it again because there are a few things I just want you to pick in your mind trusting that God will give us help to have clear understanding of how to go from here in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, in that Songs of Solomon chapter 2, we were reading from verse 10 to 13, but we're reading it from, we're reading it from King James. Yes. We are reading it from King James, New King James, and then we went to read it from the Passion Translation. And I want to just note towards the end of that uh, 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 Songs of Songs or Songs of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 13. He said, can you not descend that's how the uh, Passion Translation put it. Can you not discern this new day of your destiny breaking forth around you? The early signs of my purposes and plans are bursting forth. The early signs of my purposes and plans are bursting forth. The budding vines of new life are now blooming everywhere. The fragrance of their flowers whispers, there is change in the air. There is change in the air. Arise, my love, my beautiful companion, and run with me to the higher place. For now is the time to arise and come away with me. That was the song of songs that we refer to. And why am I coming back here? Every great move of God, no matter how great it will become, has what? A beginning. Every fire that is going to engulf the whole world usually may begin with a spark. Are we together? But the first responsibility of those that are going to be carriers, going to be custodians, or going to be vessels of a move of God, was for them to recognize the beginning of it. For them not to ignore the beginning of it. And for them to understand even the way things that will overwhelm the whole world can begin even in a little place. And not to despise, I, I hope you remember a passage said, and thou shalt not despise the days of what? Of small things, of little beginning. No matter how great a mighty move of God is going to be, there is always the early beginnings of it. There is always the, the breaking forth of it. The early signs of God's purposes and plans bursting forth. And it is important that we will understand the beginning. So I want to take this time now before I will begin to analyze from other experiences in the word of God, how men 
who began to believe God for a great move, they recognized the beginning of it. And they were willing to grab the beginning of it and begin to run with it until it became a mighty fire in their hands. And by the grace of God, we have seen the beginning of something. God has allowed us to recognize the beginning of another move. But what we are describing now is still the early beginnings of it. The early signs of it. Even though it appears already overwhelming, even though by the grace of God, it's, it's, it's like it's everywhere now, but I must confess to you that this is still the early signs of its beginning. Hey, hallelujah. Some people say, ah, how can Bragulé say this is the early signs of the beginning? When this work has started for many years, Yes, that's true. That's true. All the many years you have talked about, they are great years, but they are years of preparation. They are years of preparation. We can count it as the part of our years. That's all right. But the Bible spoke about John the Baptist said, John the Baptist was in the wilderness. For 30 solid years until the day of his showing unto Israel. Praise the Lord. And even when the day of his showing to Israel now came, there was a beginning. There was a tiny beginning that suddenly became an overwhelming experience and the whole city were running to the wilderness where John the Baptist was. But there is always a beginning. We're going to, I know that some years ago, in preparing you for this time, we have spent time, we talked about this. We talked about recognizing the little spark. We talked about recognizing the small cloud like a man's hand. Abi, we talked about knowing, recognizing this is that. But thank God that God is never tired of coming again and again and again and particularly now that we have come at the threshold of what God is about to do. Now, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. So can we quickly trace. What is the procedure. That has brought this beginning. Before we now see how it breaks forth in diverse places. Praise the Lord. And the third day. There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Permit me to tell you something that is very, very interesting to me. Did Jesus organize that wedding? Eh? Was it a preaching program? Was Jesus at the center stage of it? What was it? Just a wedding. Just a wedding. Many times, when God is about to begin something, in our head, because we are looking for supernatural, we always think it has to begin in the heavenlies. We, we normally think that since we are talking of a mighty move of God, something that is coming all the way from heaven, in our mind, we would normally not expect that it has anything to do with natural things. Abi? But I want you to note that when God will begin to move and manifest what he's saying, 
it might actually begin in ordinary situation. It might begin in things that you don't even think has any spirituality to it. And it may begin where you don't even expect that anything serious will take place. So here was Jesus attending a wedding that he was invited to attend. And he was not invited as the preacher. Praise the Lord. And honestly speaking, maybe they did not even think he's a special guest because there was no seat for him in the wedding. Or did you think there was a seat there? Because the mother had to go outside to go and talk to him. So, the first thing I want you to note is that even what we are expecting God to do may begin. Hallelujah. May begin in ordinary places. A revival may break forth in a burial ceremony. Is it possible? Eh? That you are just attending a, a barrier and they are doing the night VG and the choir are singing. They just came to play and they ask a brother to bring a short exhortation before we continue to sing. Is it possible for God to come down? Eh? Is it possible for conviction to fall on the heart of people? Aha. So let me first note with you that supernatural things, they don't need supernatural activity for it to happen. So in responding to God saying, you will see greater things than this, you will see heaven open, you see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, please do not think that that excludes ordinary things. Don't think it excludes ordinary experiences, ordinary activities. Do not think it excludes going to your class to teach your history or your geography or your uh, physics or whatever. It does not exclude going to the primary school to go and teach as if you are doing a normal thing. So Jesus was invited and he attended this ceremony. His mother was invited. We don't know the connection, but they are all in Cana of Galilee. And they went for this wedding. And in this particular wedding, or this marriage, both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So they were in, they attending marriage. Meanwhile, the Lord had made a declaration that Nathaniel and those that were following him were holding dear to their heart. Hereafter, 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 you will see greater things than this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you will see heaven open. And for an ordinary man like myself, when they say you will see heaven open, what will you likely have been doing? You will have been looking up like this. And trying to even spiritualize it. They say, Bro, it's, 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 I'm seeing the heaven opening. I'm seeing the heaven opening. Please, sir. It has nothing to do with all of that. And don't trivialize what God is about to do. And don't let your expectation become so narrow that you are looking for uh, extraneous activities. No. The context of an outpouring, 
the context of this promise of revival is still going to be in the natural. It's still going to be in the ordinary. It's still going to be happening naturally. And so as I'm talking about the active faith to walk under open heavens, the first thing I'm wanting you to note is that this open heavens is possible and it can happen in ordinary places, in ordinary activities, in ordinary things that you do ordinarily. And yet God will invade it. Praise the Lord. I know most of us we loved what happened in Acts chapter 3. Did we love it? That brother Peter and John they were attending a prayer meeting. Isn't it? At the synagogue. And then there was this man that by it, it, it's a normal routine. She normally sat at the beautiful gate. To do what? To beg for arms. That's a normal thing. If you go to very big uh, places where people are trooping in and out, what do you notice? You see the Almanjiri people. You see beggars standing. And any big car that is coming, they come quickly and say, You will see some that are deaf, they wear something in front of their chest, begging. I went for a, a function the other day, and because I was the one preaching, and it's a very big gathering of the whole community, the whole city, we were coronating the king. And it took me a deal of time to be able to drive out. And I said, the, the protocols were trying to get us out into the car. Oh, come and see the myriads of beggars that were standing by the, the window. And they were asking, all they're asking is, even if you give them five naira, even if you give them ten naira, even if it's twenty naira, it's okay. And when we just did something and threw out, oh, they were already saying, thank you, thank you, God bless you. It was enough. So it was ordinary. And Peter was not going there to perform a miracle. <laughs> Are you getting me now? What was Peter going to do? Just to join a prayer meeting where he was not the officiating minister, he was not to lead the prayer. Because those that are qualified to conduct that prayer, they must be Levites. And Peter was not one of them. Peter was not a priest, he's a, he's, a, he's a barbarian and a fisherman. So, you don't expect. But now they are just going. And somebody is asking for an ordinary something. Are we together? Which could have been undo ordinarily. But on that particular day, Brother Peter did not have anything to give this man. And what did he say? Silver and gold I don't have. And that could have been the end of that discussion. Am I right? Just like it has happened to many of us many times that somebody came to beg and you didn't have something. I said, Kai, to be honest with you, I didn't have change. And you did your land and next time and you will have gone. But on this particular Unplanned occasion. Not arranged. Nobody expected anything. Something moved upon Peter. And Peter said, look at us. Look at us. Silver and gold we don't have. But there's something we have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Do what? Stand up and walk. There was no shaking of the head. It just just that God wanted to demonstrate his power. 
And the man was still looking at them because it has never happened now. I've been sitting here for 40 years. And if I knew how to stand up, I would have stood up long before. And you are saying, stand up and take up your bed and walk. What do you mean by that? Did you understand it now? And then when he was staring at them and said, what do you mean? They said, we said, stand up now. And he was not sure. So they used their hand to lift him. And then he did not fall down again. And that was the turnaround. That changed the prayer meeting. Eh? The meeting started as an ordinary prayer meeting. Am I correct? The choir that were going to present their special number, they were there. The officiating minister, they were there. Only to discover that there was a noise. There was an eruption from the back. And when they were looking, people were no longer looking in front. They started looking back and see something has happened. Only to see the man that was crippled. Holding the hand of Peter and John. Limping, leaping, leaping, and dancing. Ah, ah. And then prayer meeting was cancelled. There was a divine interruption. May God interrupt our ordinary things. May you begin to experience divine interruptions. That you just, and I know what I'm talking about. I have seen it. But in very little, 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 little ways. Little ways. Little ways. That gave me assurance that God can actually give revival. I've seen it very small, 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 small. As if God was assuring me many years ago that pursuing revival is possible. Ordinary things. That if I describe to you, you will be surprised. Ordinary things. Ordinary things like we came together one day to eat, to eat our eba with the brethren. And we just said, let brother so and so do what? Bless our food. That's all we wanted. Just bless this food. And then he said, just before I will bless the food, there is one song in my mind. Let's just take this song to worship God before I bless the food. Hey, hallelujah. I have seen glimpses of what I'm looking for. God has allowed me to see it in small, 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 small measure. But now God is saying, you will see greater things than this. That's how we took that song that the brother was raised. And you know, some of us had the knife. Some of us had the fork. And then the plate that we were to be collecting food in as we pray. It became the drum. And we sang from, I suppose, about 7 p.m. And nobody could stop until 5 a.m. What happened to everybody we want to eat? It has become cold. The soup has become slept. And all of that. And we were singing and worshiping. And the Holy Ghost was coming down. And people in the company say, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And they were coming to join us in that room. The Holy Ghost. And I will not forget how some of the persons began to voluntarily confess the wrong things in their lives. Some say, ah, I am so afraid of God. I have to confess what I, say, what I did. So we were wondering, what did he have to confess? Then he stood up and says, kiss me. I am arrogant. Whenever brother so and so said, let us open our Bible. I used to disdain him in his heart. 
I say, what does he know? That he's sitting, open Bible, open Bible, open Bible. But this night, the Lord came and struck me. <sighs> say, you are too arrogant. You are proud. And I don't use proud people. Please pray for me. Uh -uh. I will never have seen that. I would never have known that such a thing happens. We have seen glimpses of what we are talking about. That happens in ordinary things. That changes situation. That turns people's life around. And I'm expecting you will see greater things than that. <laughs> so the first thing I want you to note is that the third day, they were just attending wedding. But God uses an ordinary situation to become an occasion for the start, for the beginning of what God wants to do. So I want to first ask all of you, do not despise the days of little beginning. Praise the Lord. Thank God, Brother Shitu is here today. And Brad Dennis, you remember, we went for a meeting, a normal routine meeting that we used to do when I go to Ghana. And this is a meeting that is structured. I, we are not in charge. I'm just an invited guest. And all of us were given slots to preach. When my own time comes, say, one hour, you stop. Another person is going to take over. Another person is going to take over. That's how that meeting has been. But I kept going because I always felt that God wants to do something. But in this particular meeting that day, as usual, the white man that was to preach first just finished preaching. And when we finish preaching like that, we go and take tea. Before we come for the second, so you can see how serious the meeting can be. <laughs> and the organizer, the man who is in charge, is always announcing and saying, Well, we have uh, 20 minutes. Braguile is going to come now and speak to us for 45 minutes, and then we'll continue this, we'll continue that. That's how it was. And I was always obeying. Now, this meeting on that day, we started preaching ordinarily. And I was reading from my note because they always insist that I should, I should prepare the note so that they can print it. So I was reading. You never thought that I could be reading message. But that did not stop God from working that day. So as I was preaching and talking like this, suddenly something happened. One hefty man just walked out of the meeting. Very tall. You know I'm a tall man, but this man is taller than me. I'm more huge. And he just walked from the meeting, from the congregation. And he came directly to the pulpit. And he grabbed the microphone from my hand by force. The next thing I was expecting is a slap on my face. That was the next thing I was expecting because he was very aggressive. He came, he was not smiling. His eyes was like this and he collected the mic. And everybody was watching. What is the next thing? As Brother Billy offended this man, what is the matter? Then he carried the microphone and he said, you people, you call me precipita. You don't know me. I'm a womanizer. I have been cheating my wife. My church members, they don't know that I'm like this. I'm a womanizer. What will I do? And then he fell down. That was when I, I got a little courage. <laughs> that was when I, I now gathered a bit. Then when he fell down, he was rolling and crying. I went and picked the microphone. And I said, we cannot continue this message. 
God has come. And there are many of us like this man. I didn't say more than that. That's how the people began to come. They began to weep. They began to cry. They began to, ah, I thought, no. Uh, this kind of thing I'm seeing here, perhaps we saw it some time back in one MLR. And when people say, I have not yet undressed, I have not yet undressed here. I didn't expect it in a structured meeting. I wasn't expecting, eh? Of ministers, these are preachers. I wasn't expecting that. But that day, the altar was filled with tears. They forgot their cassock. And I wasn't sure whether they are serious. I thought it was just an emotion. I went and told the organizer, the man who invited me, I said, what do we do now? He said, Bragule, what do we do? Continue. God has changed our program. I said, Normally, the meeting must end at one latest so that people can go and eat because you must book for your food. They have paid. They have ticket. And it will be a cheating that you pay for money, food, and all, and you are not eating. No. I say, it's time for you to go and eat. He said, no. Let the food wait. We are not, we are not interested in food now. We want God. Do you remember, sir? Though we did not have plan for follow-up, we had to sit in that meeting. Every day until we ended. Brad Dennis was there with me. And what do I see? Something turned. A married woman came and said, I'm following you to Boko now. I said, no, we don't do like that. I said, no. I have seen Jesus. I've seen what I'm, I follow you to where you are coming from. I say, ah, it's not like that now. Another pastor. Another, do you know that because of that meeting, it was not in my agenda. We spent three more days. And they were all still leading. They said, we need to come back. This was September. We had to fix another meeting for November. By the time I'm getting back, pastors have gathered again. He said, we want this discipleship. That year, 26 pastors all the way from Ghana came for MLA. And that was the beginning of what God is doing presently in Ghana. There is a beginning to every move. As I'm talking to you now, the camp in Ghana, which we call Camp Goshen, is about five or, or five times the uh, Bethany Resort. Are you hearing me at all? And yet, the beginning could be ordinary. It could start where you never thought. It could break forth where you don't think about. So the first thing we want to deal with is that we must believe God that what he says he will do, nothing can stop him from doing it. Hallelujah. And that we are not looking for any special space. We are not looking for any special space. God can invade any place. He can take over anything. He can take over even dining tables. He can take over structured meetings. He can take over. And I've seen him taking over several times. Do you know that because of the way I have seen that God can take things over. I was always begging God that don't let me finish preaching until somebody will interrupt us. 
I have seen it. But I'm hearing God saying, what you have seen is nothing compared with what I'm about to do. You will see greater things than this. And this news will be breaking forth everywhere. Some of you, you will begin to see things, the beginning of it. It will begin somewhere, but it will not stop. Praise the Lord. Now, look at what we want to look at here now. When they lack wine, when the, uh, the drinks finished, normally, when you have uh, been serving and there's no more, uh, people know what they normally do at the back. Eh? You know, sometimes you are serving food, you are serving food, and, and maybe you didn't know that the crowd is still coming. So you are putting soup. You are putting two, three spoons for one person and all of that. Suddenly, suddenly you saw that your thing is great and then you saw people. What did you do? You just quickly went and had some water. <laughs> eh? Eh, Mama Funlayo, you know now. <laughs> you just, you, at the back, you just had some water. Uh, if you want, you may add hot water. So that it is not too cold. You just add water and then mix, 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 mix. And when you taste it, you think that ah, this thing is going to be, it's not going to be sweet again. What do you do quickly? You put salt and then go on. Everything is served. Yes. That's a normal thing <laughs> that people normally do. So they were doing that thing. They were now turning the wine. They are now mixing it anyhow. So that since people are drunk, they don't drink anything. But the mother of Jesus, and that's the first person I want to talk to you about. And I want to call it the mother's company. There must be mother's company in this move of God. What is the characteristic of the mother's company? I don't want you to just think it's because it's mother of Jesus. Because you see that the way Jesus addressed her. How did he address her? Woman. Aha. So I want you to know that this mother's company. They are a group of persons. That are persistent in pleading for intervention. There are people that will not take a no for an answer. There are people that they know that the power of God is available. Hallelujah! They believe that Jesus can do something. All that matters is to get him to do it. There is no doubt in their mind that he can do it. There is no doubt in their mind that whatever they ask him to do, if he wants to do it, it will be done. Such people, when they begin to pray, when they begin to enter into the place of intercession, they are asking because they believe that God has power to do it. Are you hearing me? It's different from you just go for a prime meeting and even in your heart, there's a doubt whether God will work or not. So you pray, suke, 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 and you go and sleep. And you tell yourself, say, well, God, maybe God's not working. But for this company of women, this mother's company, something happened. She knew that they lacked one. She saw the need. She saw that this thing will collapse if God does not intervene. And she was looking for a divine intervention. And she recognized that this Jesus, even though nobody knows him, even though nobody is talking about him, even though he's not in the center of the arrangement, he is the one that had the solution to this thing that will soon scatter. So what did she do? 
Talk to me. What did she do? She went to talk to Jesus. All of you listen. She did not go to talk to the master of ceremony. Because she knows that the master of ceremony has no power to change anything. She knows that they cannot do anything. They have done their best. They are exhausted. There is no power in their hand to do anything. Friends, I, I need mother's company. Who will no longer be complaining about people that can do nothing? We need mother's company. Who knows that even these people that you think are in charge, they are no more in charge. They have lost their charge. They have no power. They are confused. If you see them talking, they are only talking for talking. They have nothing to do. They know that there is nothing. They know that there is no wine. And they are only deceiving people. Because they have nothing else to give them. And this mama knew. That these people are in trouble. But they don't know how to handle it. Let me go to him. Who can bring solution. Will I have mothers here? Will I have a company of women? I use women not because a man cannot enter this ministry. Praise the Lord. But I, 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 I prefer to, to, to call them the mother's company. Because when a mother is crying for something, they have a tenacity of crying and never giving up. To such a point that even in the scripture, God said, for me to intervene in the affairs of Israel, go and call the wailing women. Is there something like that in the Bible? Let them come and wail. Let them come and cry like women will normally cry. But this time they are not crying for food. They are not crying for uh, little, little things. They are not crying for uh, the witches that is uh, troubling them. No, they are crying for God to intervene. This particular company that knows and believes the power of God, they trust in the ability of Jesus. They know that if Jesus stands up to walk, something will change. So they knew that stop talking to people, stop complaining about situation, stop about worrying about people, Go to him who can create a change. Are we going to have such company here? And you are going to say, Lord, since I know how to cry, since I know how to approach the throne of grace, since I know how to talk to him who can bring a change, I will rather go to talk to him rather than talk about problem, talk about people, talk about government, Talk about all of those people. These are people that can do nothing. These are people that if you meet them in their ordinary sense, they are just ordinary people. Don't mind that when they are coming, they are coming with a siren and they are doing as if they are in charge. They are not. They are not at all. When you go near them, you just see that they are just, they are helpless. Don't know what to do. In fact, you used to pay me how they will start using the situation of people. People are crying. They're only using it to crack joke. Those are the people you are blaming. They don't know what to do. I need people because of the promise that God has made who will engage God in a believing prayer. What is the believing? A complete trust in the capacity of Jesus to make a change. That's what I'm looking for. So let's now put it like this. It doesn't matter whether the wine has finished. It doesn't matter whether the young people are very, 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 very reckless. It doesn't matter whether they have misbehaved so much that nobody can do anything. 
They are so bad. That's not their problem. They know that wherever sin abounds, grace abounds much more. If only we can get Jesus to do what? To act. Amen. I need people like that. Now, I want to intersperse it with small, small testimonies for you to know that even though what we are looking for is on a bigger scale, God has shown that it is possible. Some years ago, I think 1980 or 81, it must be 80 or 81, we were doing a school campaign. We normally go to secondary school to preach to students and preach to them and see what God will do. So that particular time, we decided to go to Amafu. Those of you that come from Kasnala, on the way to Zakibia, and when you come to Tungov, Tungov community, Amafu, before you brand to Uba, if you want to go to Uba, and some of you, you know what I'm talking about. All right, sorry. You know, this meeting is international, so they say, Bragbile, come away from Benue, talk to us about some of us are in South Africa. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You are going to follow me. Now, we went to this school, and we were to preach. And we set up everything we set up. And I was standing to preach. Some students have gathered, they are hearing me. Then this young man just walked in. Who is there? What are they doing? Who permitted you to come and preach here? And with his leg, he scattered all that we gathered together. And because the students were so afraid of him, all students scattered and were left alone. And I turned to the brother who was in the school. He said, ah, that boy is the principalities of this school. Teachers fear him. The principal fear him. He's the one that is in charge of girls in the college. He distributes girls to teachers. If any teacher needs a girl to sleep with, you just call him. He will organize one for you. <laughs> when the brother described to me like that, I said, wow. I said, okay, let's close the crusade. He looked at see if he has won the battle. So we closed. We went back. I told my brother and a few people who went to say, there is one principality in Amafu that we are going to collect. And we are not going back until God gives him to us. So we took, I think, two weeks just to pray. <laughs> you need to see that God answers prayer. And I'm praying that there will arise people in this meeting who we pray and pray until something happens. Who will not complain. Who will not see how rough the boys are. Who will not see how reckless they have become. But who will see the power in Christ that can engage and finish and carry out his purpose once he stands up to work. But he's waiting for someone like me, like you, to say, Lord Jesus, let it come. We are insisting that you must move. So we prayed and prayed. And one thing we told God, say, God, it is this boy. So we took his name. Don't want to mention his name here because uh, the news will go everywhere. We took his name to, to heaven. We're saying, God, give us this boy. Arrest this boy. We know now that if we arrest this boy, our mouth will be changed. Lord, give us this boy. The next time we went, we didn't plan crusade. We were looking for him. When we caught him, and we just called him, he thought we came to a fight. Because he scattered our equipment last time. 
No. He said, we just go and say, oh, my friend, ah, ah, you're a powerful man in this place. He said, yes, people need to recognize who is in charge here. <laughs> ah. But one hour talking with this young man, we saw what we have never seen before. We saw the power of God descend upon him. He melted. And he began to weep. And he began to confess. I'm a terrible boy. I have misbehaved. I have spoiled many girls. I don't respect all these teachers because they are all, they are all my customers. But I know my life is going to waste. I'm going to perish. Ah, I'm going to perish. What can I do to be saved? What can I do to be saved? And he fell down on his knees. And he gave his life to Christ. And he went and brought wraps, wraps of Indian M that he was smoking. And they over to us and said, what do I do with this now? We burnt it. Then you know what he told us. He said, I scattered the meeting before. I will gather it for you. <laughs> I will gather the meeting. We went just to, <laughs> before we know it, he blew a whistle. Everybody came. And he was the one who stood up and said, I called all of you here. You know me. You know what I've been doing. You know my life. All of you. But something has happened to me. My life has been affected. I have been deceiving you people. He did not allow us to preach. His testimony alone brought the students. And by the grace of God, this young man became our uncle. And the whole of that community. There are two schools. There is Tongo community. There is a comprehensive government school. Almost opposite. What happened in Tongo jumped into the other one. By the next time we went, two schools were all gathered teachers, the principal was talking to us and said, what did you do to him? He has been the biggest problem I have here. But since that time that you people came and affected me, everything is quiet. You people should be coming. Whatever you want in this school, we will give you. There can be a revival. Caleb was reminding me the other day. It was as these guys, these young people gathered and were teaching and they were giving their life to Christ and I was looking for what song shall we teach them so that they will not forget. That's when we composed that song spontaneously. The time I have spent for the old man is enough. I will now live for Jesus forever. The time I have spent for the old man is enough. I will now live for Jesus forever. By gone, by gone, it is by gone. Old man, old man, it is by. Come and see the children. They were beating their chest. They were beating their desk a bar. But you don't know how far that song has gone. You don't know that that song, they sing it in the NKST. All the women choir is their song. Because God could come down in a small village. The young man became a preacher. Somebody went and discovered him somewhere in, in uh, Itigidi. And he was telling them, say, ah, Brother Gwili is my father. Even when I don't know again. Don't. So, what is the first company I'm looking for? The mother's company. Who is this mother's company? They believe so much in the power of God to answer prayer that they will not stop praying until he moves. There's a difference. The difference is that they were acting by faith in the ability of God to carry out anything he wants to do. And so they know that 
if only we can get him to stand up to walk, the matter is settled. We there, you know, yesterday you stood up, you said, God, pour upon me the spirit of grace and supplication. Abi, and uh, tonight, will you say, Lord, put me in that company? People that believe that prayer can settle any issue. People that believe that there's nothing that prayer cannot deal with when it is God at work. People that no longer see impossibility when they can pray. People that no longer accept defeat when they know they can call on him who calls into existence those things that be not as though they were. Am I communicating with you? Now, the Lord Jesus said to her, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. What a good reason. Woman, what have I done? What, I, what, what do I have to do with you? Woman, <laughs> that is his mother. But the way this woman is coming now, she's wearing a different garment. She's insisting. They have no wine. And you are the one that has what will solve their problem. I'm looking for people who say, Father, these people, they have no wine. The reason why everything is scattering is because there is no wine. Someone who will say, Lord, look at the way this school has scattered. Look at the way these children, how they are just misbehaving everywhere. It's because, Lord, there is no wine. Teachers cannot control them because they are not controllable. Until you rise up, there will be no change, Lord. Suddenly, woman, what have I to do with you? My time is not come. You know what the woman did? The woman went to the next action. The woman knew that you will do something. Whether your time has come home or your time has not come home, there is a need here. And you are the one that has answer to this matter. Did you understand what I'm saying? I know you have power. I know you are able to do it. I know. And I know that even if you just ask God now, God will do it. Why don't you do it for us, sir? I'm not going to until you do it. Why Jesus was still saying, my time has not come, my time has not come. The woman turned to the servants. His mother says unto the servants, whatsoever he says to you, do it. I know he would say something. He will act. God said, call upon me, I will answer you. He will answer. You know something is happening to my spirit. Nothing will be impossible for this move of God. All it will cost is prayer. And I've told you the kind of prayer. Not this kind of prayer. Hey God, hey, kill my enemy. Hey, they, do not, they don't want me to be promoted. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. These men are mourning for Jesus. They want to see him. They want to see his glory. They want to experience his power. And they cannot give themselves rest until the glory comes down. Uh -huh. And all over, wherever we are gathered, those of you in South Africa just know there's nothing about South Africa that is impossible if we can pray. Some of you are sitting in Europe and saying, it's not like that, it's not like that. 
Let me tell you. Let me tell you the truth. I have read stories of revival in Europe, in UK. And I have seen that when men prayed, God has done the same thing that we are talking about before. In the same place where you are thinking it's so dry, people have been rushing to go and listen to the word of God even during winter. Because God was moving in answer to prayer. He will do it again. God will do it again. So, I'm looking for people, the women, the, the, the mother's company, I call them, if you can get any other name for it, whatever you like, but these people are people that are praying. There are people that are praying, not just praying. They are praying into action. The power that is embedded in Christ Jesus to carry out anything he wants to carry out. Anything that he wants to carry out. We have prayed, but I'm hearing Jesus say, either too, you have not asked me anything. Now come and ask. This open heavens, you will see greater things. Now, so what is the next people? Which I think is the direct instruction to us. And the mother said to the servant, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. We are looking for people now who when they have prayed and they are still praying, they are ready to obey whatsoever he tells them to do. He said, whatever he tells you to do, what? Do it. And I just want to make a quick, a quick explanation of that. Because sometimes what it tells you to do may look foolish. Now, the Bible said there was uh, these water pots. Water pots that they use for washing hand, wash hand basin. It used to be used in those days when people are coming for purification. They wash their feet, they wash their mouth and all of that. So there used to be plenty water, water tanks, so that people would be fetching water and washing their feet and all, before they would go into the temple. So the Bible said, there was these six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three fuckings apiece. And so Jesus said unto them. Now listen. The last time Jesus spoke, Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not come. I don't care about that. You will do something. The next time Jesus was going to speak, what is he saying now? He said to them, fill the water, water pots with water. <laughs> Somebody has prayed Jesus unto action. Somebody that will not accept a no for an answer has prayed Jesus and he had to act. And the woman, Mama, Mama said, look, you servants, whatever he said to you, go and do it. So he, she positioned them to do whatever he tells them to do. And then Jesus said, talk. Something had to be done. Even though I was thinking my hour has not come. But she's pulling something that must come out of me now. May the Lord help us. But you know for me, there's a big difference between that passage and where I where are now. Where we are now, he said, my time has come. Are you hearing me? He himself said, the time for me to move has come. The set time for God to favor Zion has come. Season have changed. I have come now to show forth my glory. 
So I cannot even see that reluctance now. I can see that when we begin to pray and pray aright and pray according to faith in his power. Please, sir, I don't want you to follow those empty talk. Say, have faith in your faith. No. There's nothing like that in the Bible. That's empty psychology and false doctrine. The only thing in the Bible is have faith in God. Am I right? It is in God. When I say have faith in God, that means have faith in God's ability, in God's capacity, in God's wisdom to be able to carry out his own purpose according to his power that is at work in us. Have faith in God. Have faith that God will do beyond what you can think or imagine in any situation. Hallelujah. Go and fill the water pot with water. Those who are very intelligent will say, uh-uh. they are saying there is no wine. And you are saying we should go and be fetching water. What is the meaning of that? now? Uh-uh. And this is a water pot that nobody is using for a long time. And you are saying we should come and fill it with water. What's the meaning of this now? But the instruction they were giving is whatever it tells you to do, do it. Do you know that God may be giving you little, little instructions that may become the reason for the outburst? Praise the Lord. A brother some years ago was told he was a secondary school student and a teacher in their school. And he had come, he was talking to me because God affected his own life and there was something God was doing in his own life. And I met him, he ran to my he said, sir, I want God to do something in our land. I want God to do something. But meanwhile, he's teaching in a secondary school. He said, God told him, can you give me one hour every afternoon? So he said, between four and five, every afternoon, he will go and sit under a tree and he will be praying. And God was saying, pray for the school. Pray for the boys. He was in the boys' school. Opposite was the girls' school. He was praying for the boys. So one afternoon, while he was praying, according to what happened, a young man, a young boy, also a ringleader in the college, walked up to him and called him by his name and said, Sir, why are you always sitting here? What are you sitting here to do? Then he said he felt like telling him, I sit here every afternoon for one hour. Because I have been praying that something will happen to you. Ah. That God said there's something that is wrong with you. That's why I've been sitting here and praying. You can't imagine that little discussion. The young man broke down and said, For me. Me. That's why you have been sitting here to pray. I say yes. So what should I do that God will have mercy on me? That's how he led that boy to Christ. Now listen to the story. The boy left him that evening. It's now about six o'clock. And under the conviction of sin, the boy was weeping. So he went back to the boy's hostel. You know, he was a tyrant. He was, he was a terror. When he entered the hostel, they saw him crying. They were saying, what happened? What happened? What happened? He said, I'm a sinner. Ah. Before you know it, his own room, the boys were weeping. 
they were crying. Conviction of sin was falling. The next room, the next room, student could not sleep throughout the night. The following day, to dress to go to class, the boys were still weeping. So they went to class. A teacher wanted to teach. And one boy raised up his hand and said, Sir, before you teach us anything, we want to confess our sin. We can't listen to you until God will have mercy on us. Ah, that's how the teacher cannot teach. This thing was happening for a whole week. Nobody can teach. Children were weeping morning and evening and they were only singing and preaching. The thing jumped to the sister school opposite. And guests were also crying. When nobody can do anything for one week, going to two weeks, the principal sent for me. I traveled all the way to Igala land. He said, Brad Billy. I said, what's happening, sir? He said, we have no known for the past over one week. We are not able to do any class. These children are just crying and repenting and confessing their sins. We have not been able to teach anything. As it's happening here, it's happening on the other side. Few of the brothers that we have been praying and begging God for revival in Igala land that time. They said, but really that's what has happened though. We think God has come. We think God has come. We think God has come. So, we said, let's, let's, let's Let's add fire. Let's add fire. Let's continue. Let's continue. But because the two principals, though they are believers, God has touched their lives. They said, but we have a problem. This is a school under the Ministry of Education. The Ministry of Education was not here. That we are taking two weeks and we are not teaching. What shall we do? And the way this thing is moving, we are only feeding the children. They are not even eating. Some have started fasting. So what do we do? And because the school was originally belonging to mission, and as at that time, the mission, that time, oh my God, they excommunicated several of my students simply because they spoke in tongues. So as soon as they heard that something like that is happening, the uh, leaders, they came. We don't want this kind of thing in our school. We don't want this kind of thing. Close down the school. That fire was running through. So because the principals don't know what to do, the proprietors came to say, Close down the school. They made an emergency closure so that the children can go. They were going crying. They were going weeping. Some are going preaching. I don't know what will have happened if people that know how to manage a move of God could stand there. It could have overwhelmed the whole land. But that school never remained the same again. Even when they try to bring the children back, you still see the relics. But things have reduced. It is possible for revival to break forth again. Are you hearing me? It is possible, but it has to be another company of obedient servants. People that are willing to do whatsoever he tells you to do, even if it looks foolish. That at the end of this meeting, we will be asking, Lord, in this year, what will you have me to do? Is it possible that God will tell one of you and say, begin to gather 
children, children. Start a children's club. Even though it's children, before you know it, I will hand over their parents to you. You say, but I don't have something. There's a, a mango tree under your, in front of your house. Gather there. We don't have chairs. Get mad. I don't have cardboard. Come and get the back of your calendar. Use the back of your calendar. And you will see what God will do. What he told them to do was ordinary. They could fetch water. Could they fetch water? God will not tell you what you cannot do. Even as we are pursuing revival, we are pursuing an outburst of the spirit of God. He will tell you only to do what you can do. There's something you can do. And it may look ordinary. And you might be imagining that, how can that if we do that now, what will that do? Do it. You can't change water to wine, but you can fetch water from the well. Am I right? Do what you can do. He never tells you to do what you cannot do. Just do your own. In this year, God, who is opening the heavens and say you will see greater things than this, even though we are saying, oh, you will see greater things, you will see this, you will see that, you will see that, it is in the context of ordinary things that we will do in obedience. I'm looking forward to several of us becoming the company of servants that will do whatever he tells them to do. Sisters, you may be a single girl and God said, start, start singing with your single ladies around. Sing from house to house. He said, eh? to sing from house to house, go. Nobody knows what will happen to your singing. And you will see a troop of young women, young girls under conviction of the Holy Spirit. You can do what he tells you to do. He will never tell you what you cannot do. He will do what he alone can do. But he will ask you just to honor you to ask you to do the little that you can do. Shall we be obedient servants? Eh? That in this day of our divine visitation, in this day that God has decided to arise and to do, <coughs> and to do something in our generation, we will be acting in obedience by faith. Active faith that shows obedience. And as they did, he gave them another instruction which again was very, very touching to me. And they filled them up to the brim. And he says to them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. Let me ask you, was there a prayer? Check your Bible. He prayed over the water. Eh? He spat on the floor. Talk to me now. He shook the, the pot. He shouted to heaven and said, Father! Father! Yeah! He did all of that drama. Eh? What did he say? Say, carry the water now. Take it to the master ceremony. If we don't believe God, 
our sense, even our religious sense of what we think is spiritual, will not allow us to allow God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Some of you, as you are sitting before me now, you have an idea of a spirituality you are talking about. And that religious idea that looked to you something is a hindrance to God. It will not allow God to walk. You go somewhere, the Lord say, lay hands on this man. Instead of laying hands on the man. Because in your mind, if I just do like that, there will be nothing spiritual about it. It will look ca casual. So what did you do? You now bring your two hands. Oh. Yay! What is making you do that is unbelief. Unbelief that says what God told you to do is too simple for anything to happen. And that the people need to be impressed that you are doing something spiritual. Unbelief. I hope you know that that was what terminated the ministry of Moses. Unbelief. God said to Moses, go and speak to the rock in the presence of the people. Then what did he do? He carried the rod and in order to, he gathered the people said, you stiff naked people come, shall we bring you water out of this rock? Then he carried the thing. Bam! Bam! God said, eh? You did not believe me as to sanctify me before the people. It's okay. I had thought you would get there. You are not going again. Active faith that believe God even when what he tells you to do appears too casual and ordinary. Can we believe God? You know, I'm coming to this point talking to you because heaven is already bending, waiting to drop the grateful shower. But because according to divine protocol, someone on earth must host what God wants to do. There must be a human vessel that God will use to bring up his purpose. That's why we are talking. And I pray that God will be able to walk through you both to win and to do of his good pleasure. Hallelujah. Before I leave that point, bear the water now that you have fetched. Go and give to them. You know, this passage so much dealt with me the other day. As they were going, what were they going with? Eh? Water. Water. They knew where they fetched it. Am I right? They knew that they poured it. And they knew that Jesus did not touch it. They knew that nothing supernatural seemed to have taken place. So they were going with water in obedience. How many times I fell that the message that God has given me to go and preach, even in my mouth, is water. I don't even feel any spirituality in it. And I've been tempted several times to say, God, how can this message that you are asking me to say now, how can it change souls? Don't we need to embellish it? Don't we need to look for something more jim, 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 jim? And if I ever tried, you see the presence of God will just disappear. 
I said, but what you're asking me to say is too ordinary. Nobody will say, go and say it. And I've seen many times that what look like water in my mouth, by the time it's landing in the congregation, it's like fire. I am learning how to believe God. But I am telling you this because all that we have seen before now, many, many times, what had become a big move of God in our midst. I remember I went somewhere. I'm telling you all these little, little stories because I think God is going to multiply them. And I think we are going to enter into something much more serious. The South Africans that are listening to me, they, I'm sure you'll be interested to hear this little story. I was invited to South Africa to preach. I had gone in 1997 to preach at a meeting of a whole Africa. Africa. Oh my God. The whole Africa. All the nations of Africa, evangelical people of Africa, I was the one to teach. And the word of God came and the Lord was doing something. And that meeting opened many doors. Malawi and all of that. So I finished this meeting and somebody approached me and says, brother, we need you to come back to South Africa. And we are going to do everything that is possible for you to come back because this message, our people must hear it. Hey. So I came back home. I told my wife that there's another meeting in South Africa. We need to go. We fixed. They were going to get me my ticket and all that. I arrived. I went to South Africa all the way from Boko. Now I'm telling you, whatever it tells you to do, do it all. So I got there. The meeting I was hoping to go, I thought it was going to be a city-wide meeting. Because me, an international preacher, who has preached to a continental meeting. <laughs> they now brought me. And I got there. Of course, they gave me a good accommodation where I was drinking my tea. The first night, the meeting was to start at six or something. I got ready. He said, Brad, will they wait? Ah, it's time now. He said, no, when it's time, we'll come and call you. They didn't come when it was about 8 p.m. So they came and said, Brad, we are sorry. We are feeling ashamed. The people didn't come. Nobody gathered. That's why we couldn't come to call you. Please sleep. By tomorrow, we will see. Tomorrow, I dress up again. Nobody came. Ah, this is an international preacher. <laughs> I'm just there. The next day, when they try, 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 you know, you know, when you have brought a preacher, you have to be going around from house to house and say, please now, please now, just come. Let's not disgrace him. Let's come and listen to him. So I saw as if they begged people to come, just to come and do anything. I know it was difficult. So when the meeting gathered, 10 people. I didn't know what to say because whatever I was saying, they did not, it, it didn't mean anything. So I came back. I have been there since Saturday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Up to Friday, nothing. They were pitying me. They said, brother, but I'm enjoying myself. I started praying. It became my own personal retreat. I said, Lord, you brought me here. What am I here for? What am I here for? I had very beautiful, quiet time. But because they were looking for, at least for something for me to do that would make it worthwhile. 
He said, our son is going to be circumcised. That's the first time I'm in a place where a grown-up child of 18 years is going for circumcision. You know, here we circumcise at eight days. Abby, uh -huh. this child is going to be circumcised at 18 under no anesthesia. That's the culture. And he will be going to the school. We call it circumcision school. All kind of rituals. But these people say we are Christians. We want our own to come out. So the day will come out. We want to do a kind of prayer meeting with him. Before he will go to the village and join the others. Because if he did not join others, they will not regard him as an important fellow. So, so Braguile, we are going to have some people in our parlor. We want you to please just give them a short exhortation. That's the consolation I'll be at least. I will have some people. So they came, sat in the parlor. And I was sitting there and said, Lord, what will I preach here? Say, circumcise them again. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit brought that message. I had not finished when I saw several people crying. We forgot the boy that we came to circumcise. People were crying. The person that was to be the officiating who was actually invited to preach, they had to beg him, say, look, you will conduct. Allow this brother Billy to preach. He said, guess, we have come all the way from Nigeria. He has not had the opportunity to preach. So let him preach. You can conduct. So they introduced me to this brother. So we did. But that message, the man of God that was to have preached, couldn't go home. He couldn't go home. He will come back. Brother? Brother? There is something. And I'm telling you, it was that single message that started our work in South Africa. That is what God used to begin what has now, is now spreading across Southern Africa. That you don't know how far it's going. We have so many staff in that country now and in other nations that are breaking forth out of it. So, whatsoever he tells you to do, will you be willing to do it? Even if it looks so ordinary, even if it appears demeaning, even if it's ordinary water in your mouth, if God turn it around, it can become something. Hallelujah. And so I saw God. So when they carried the water, it was only when they delivered it to the man that they themselves were surprised that what they brought has become wine. Am I right? Now, how will God show forth his glory? How are we going to see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man? We just took this particular illustration. And we were just trying to learn whatever lesson we could learn out of it. And the Bible said, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and he knew not whence it was, but the servant which drew the water knew. You know why the Bible is making that kind of emphasis? The servant that drew the water, they knew where they got the water. They knew how they carried the water. They knew that it was water. But now, water has become wine. Something ordinary had become supernatural. 
Then the man shouted. And he called the bridegroom. Who himself did not even know what was happening. Am I communicating with you? Even the bridegroom was not involved in the miracle. Something will happen in this move. That the people that you think are on stage, they will not even know how God is moving. They will just suddenly discover that something has changed. And I want to thank God for the way it is. If not that Jesus, Jesus was going to manifest his glory to his disciples. Who saw how the water was? And who knew where the water was fetched? Take the whole of that story. Did anybody know it was Jesus? Did you know that he didn't show his face? And yet his glory. I'm looking forward. That this move of God that God is going to bring about. Even though God will use some of our hands, we will not be prominent about it. It is Jesus that men will see. It is his glory that men will touch. Angels will be ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And yet, we will be quiet laborers in it. Yet, the whole city will be affected. In many things will be taking place. Miracles. Women will be, barren women will be receiving babies. All of this will be happening. And men will be asking, but who are the people doing this? Where are they getting it? That will be the character of this move of God. Because when he said, you will see heaven open. You will see angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. It will centralize Jesus and glorify him. So the Bible said, the man shouted. And I must conclude there. It says to him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men are well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. Something that God has been reserving is about to break forth. We have had all kinds. We have seen all kinds. And it has become like a ridicule. But God is keeping the, the best wine till now. Brothers, you will, see, you will see a move of God. You will see a revival that will supersede all the stories of revival we have ever read. You will see disciples that God will raise who will be solid. They will be of all, all ages, all kada. When God began to talk to us about what he was about to do, he's been, he's been guiding us. And he began to say that this coming move, we, even though it will start from the sanctuary, but it will flow. It will get into all the, all the spaces. Professionals will be affected. Business people will be affected. Government will be affected. Traditional rulers will be affected. And I want you to know that God has started it. The beginning of it is already beginning forth. You are going to see more. How wonderful it will be one day, sir, that we will have a meeting only for traditional rulers wearing their beards, some coming with their crowns, with their cow tail and with their beads and this hall will be too small 
to collect them. And we will be talking Jesus. And they will be shouting and crying for Jesus. Do you think it is impossible? We are going to see it. We started seeing it. It started happening. But whatever you have seen before is small. We started touching that reality. Our brothers in Lagos, they are overwhelmed that traditional rulers, Obas, coming with all their regalia and they are saying, please, we need you to disciple us. It's how to raise hands that we're going to palaces to disciple kings. That's our need now. How God is going to give us hands that we go and set up. They are waiting because it is time for God to do it. And I'm not just talking about Tivland. I'm not just talking about Idoma land where we already started seeing this. I'm talking of different parts. Yoruba land. Egon land. Mada land. When I finish talking about all the lands in Nigeria, all the custodians of power, potentates in different nations, you will see them. Please wait. You will watch them. God is going to do it. God has spoken that this is going to go beyond the pulpit. This thing is going to affect the academics. Researches will be coming up as a result of this revival that we redefine the issues that is going on among men. Hallelujah. This move of God is going to reset two things. That's why you will see God accelerating several of his young, young disciples and say, you go and get this from me. You go and get that because they will soon be in charge to establish the kingdom of God among men. When God signaled that to us, we knew what to do. It was to start responding. We start preparing. We start begging God. We start praying. We start drawing different class of people. We start encouraging all those that God could use in different forms. It is in this connection that we continue to trust God that the full gospel businessmen will continue to blossom because the Lord will have need of it. This revival is going to require all of that. I know that you are, you are not sure whether what I'm talking about will be, but it will come to pass. We are sitting here now. This thing will jump into government houses. We are governors and all their political advisors will be sitting down to take note. How do we govern our land? We are seeing it. We will see more of it. In the name of Jesus Christ. So but let me conclude in that verse. This beginning of miracles. Did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. And manifested for his glory. And his disciples believed on him. As I stop on this note tonight, I wish, I wish this meeting is not in the night, that it is in the day, so that I could just ask you to stand up and walk about and come back again. But <laughs> thank God, whatever we are not able to say, the Lord will say it to you. Amen. God will give increase to it in the name of Jesus. All the men 
that God now used to cause the move of God in their days. They acted. They did what he told them to do. They recognized the beginning of it. They did not despise the days of small beginning. Elijah prayed and prayed and prayed and he was sending his servant. Go and check. Go and check. Go and check. And the young man went and went and went seven times. Nothing. But Elijah knew that God who said I will send the rain upon the earth cannot lie. He said keep going. I'm not going to live here. I'm going to stay in the place of prayer until it happens. I can't even be distracted. I'm praying until something happens. Hallelujah. The young man went and went. I saw nothing except except what? A small cloud like a man's hand. Just like that. What did brother Elijah said? He said that is the sound of abundance of rain. The boy did not say I heard a sound. But as far as the man of prayer is concerned, that is the sound of the abundance of rain. Oh, yeah, move. Go and tell the king that he should go now. It's going to rain very soon. Before you know it, heavens was now black with clouds because somebody there to believe. On the day of Pentecost, just few of them, and they were speaking in tongues, and people were thinking they are drunk. But the man, Peter and the eleven, they recognized that this, this is that that Joel spoke about. You know me, I quickly went to read what the Joel spoke about. How did Joel speak about it? When I went to Joel chapter 2, all the signs that Joel said will happen, none actually happened on the day of Pentecost. And yet, Peter knew that this is that. This is the beginning of that. But when you read the scripture, and you read it from the Amplified Bible, when he said, this is that which Joel spoke about, Amplified Bible said, he said, this is the beginning of what Joel prophesied. Praise the Lord. How many of you know that they say they, we're, we're at the beginning of something now? How many of you know that? How many of you? Can you understand that? Just, 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 just take note of it. Just mark it. When we used to do visions retreat, eh? And this visions retreat, I was checking my record. We have been doing it when it's a parlor. Five of us will be doing visions retreat. Then, a parlor will not contain us again. Let's go to a primary school. Then, I remember that when we have done all of the things, we'll go and do vision retreat in Kwaibo. The Kwaibo church that time looked the big. Oh my God. Thank God for the Kwaibo brethren. Where can we so we will meet? When we didn't, when the Kwaibo looked small, we go to all Christians. There is no congregation that we have not gone. It will look big in our eyes. When we get there, we say, ah, so this is small. Because God kept saying, you cannot contain what I'm about to do. And see now, if it were that the people from Kasnala are still coming here, and the brethren from Motupu are still coming, and the brethren from uh, Makodi are still coming, will have said, but this is only Boko. I hope you know. There are people in camp. They are having their own visions retreat. There are people in BMC having their own visions retreat. Eh? 
There are people in Rice Me, they're having their own. They said, a tent is too far. They are sitting. There are people at Nka. I think Brother Emmanuel thought that he only have people that can keep in his parlor. The first day, they were over 100. Nobody begged him to go and beg the Rem Church to open up. So the church, the Rem Church Nka, is hosting Visions Retreat now. Eh? And Buruku is running. So we can't tell. But I'm just talking about the locality here. I've not gone to Yudumaland. I've not gone to all the other places. Then we have not gone to Lagos. We have not gone to Ishan. We have all the places. Can't you see a beginning of something? Can't you see that the beginning of the miracle has come? And as I'm talking, they called me from uh, South Africa. We are in the Visions Retreat. Sir. We are also gathering. They are gathering in Canada. They were calling me. They were talking to me from different parts. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Like what you said yesterday. I said, were you there? I said, we were there. But all of that is nothing compared with those who couldn't even go to anywhere who are on their own Facebook. Those that they said, sir, I was following. I was following on my own uh, YouTube. Some are on their telegram. I don't know all of this. Only for God that I've said to us, this thing we bypass you. You can't control it. You can't count where this thing is going. And you don't need to do anything about it. Have you seen the beginning? Brothers, this is only a beginning. This is only what? The beginning. Just a beginning. Every great move usually has a beginning. And the beginning many, many times looks so small that people that don't have eyes to see the invisible, they may ignore it and say, no, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. That was how some people dismissed us. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. No problem. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. And there's something here. Am I right? Eh? There's nothing there. There's nothing there. Suddenly, there's something here. Please, sir. For you to engage what God is talking about with an active faith, all the men that God talked to, this was how they have to believe God to see the beginning. We pray that as we see the beginning, it will break forth so much that none of us will be able to see the end of it. In the name of Jesus Christ. That it may look little now. But it will soon break loose. Everywhere. I dare not tell you. That the number of souls. The number of people. That God has brought. To come and throw their lives on full time. Into God's work. Is something else. I'm just sitting down and saying. Lord how do we manage this now. And they are still coming. May the Lord give you eyes to see. May the Lord activate your faith to believe. May you, not because of unbelief, cripple yourself out of what God wants to do. When God told Noah that there's going to be a flood, and God said, prepare a ark for the salvation of your people, the Bible said, by faith, he moved with fear. He did what God told him to do. When God said to Abraham, lift up your eyes. Look northward. Look let's look south. Look anywhere. 
Whatever your eyes can see is yours. When God spoke to him by faith, the Bible said, he removed his tent and went and pitched his tent where God spoke to him. Faith that brings revival is never passive. It's not a talking faith. It's an acting faith. And you know what in my mind I'm doing? I'm already enlarging. I now realize that the hands that we have now is still too small compared with what God is about to do. So we have to train more lives. We have to engage more disciples. We have to pray more that God will begin to raise younger hands, young people, old women, because the categories will be much. All these old sisters, get ready. You are the one who will be interpreting the word of God to the old women in the villages. Those of you that are retired, don't be tired. God will refire you. Because this fire will jump everywhere. And retirees, I say, what of us? What of us? Can you send us somebody that will read Bible to us? And you are the one who will lay hands upon to go and do it. Please take note of that. Take note of what God wants to do. In the coming days, and I am I'm getting overwhelmed because God is rising to do his work. Don't be afraid of where are we going to get money. That's not your business. Your business is to do what God tells you to do. He knows how to do his own work. Amen. We are talking about battle for the young. I hope you are beginning to see that there's a beginning of a move among the young people. And a few days ago, young people that the Holy Spirit is mobilizing, they walked up to me and said, this is, I wanted to check this, what we have done. And I was spellbound. I took what they said they have written and for two hours, I couldn't stop. And I could only cry to God and say, Lord, I didn't say now, let us thy servant depart in peace. No, I have not said that yet. The reason is because I want to trust God that this beginning that my eyes are seeing and the young people that are rising to run with it, God will give us opportunity to provide a level of spiritual oversight until their feet have become strong. Until they are taking territories and taking nations. And of course, I know even when we won't be traveling up and down, we will be on the mount holding the rod and watching our Joshua's dislodging the Amalekites. We are going to see our small, small Jehus going to ravage nations while we hold the rod. We are going to see and I want you to know that what we are going to see is not local, it's going to be global. global move of God that nobody could stop is here. Can you see the beginning of it? So, the last word, the last word. Let me read it. It's just one last word. And once I read that last word, 
I will be asking you to respond to God. Verse 11 is what I'm reading last. The beginning, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples did what? Believed, believed, believed on him. That's the last word. Will you believe? Eh? Will you? He said, and his disciples believed on him. Since I'm about closing, I didn't want to go on explaining what that meant. But it meant that what they saw made them to hold tenaciously to him. They knew we are not following fables. They knew that this is the Christ, the son of the living God. They knew that this is not another facade. They knew that I can commit my life to this and it will not be a waste. They knew that this is the Christ, the son of the living God. They knew and they believed on him. I pray that you will believe on him. You will believe in what he says. You will believe in what he is doing. You will not just say, well, Bragbile said, and Bragbile said. I pray you will know that this is not Bragbile said. And even if it is Brother Billy that said, did you hear the word of God? What did he say? He said, believe the Lord and believe his prophets and you will prosper. Have you read that in the Bible before? Eh? Believe the Lord and believe his prophets and you will prosper. After all, for all the years, have we told you lies? Even when people say, we will die in one year, have we died? When all kind of people gang together, gang together against the word of God, has he succeeded? So why are you the last to believe? Why are you the last to believe? But if you don't want to believe, don't disbelieve. Are you hearing me? If it looks difficult for you to believe because what I'm saying is outrageous, keep your mouth shut. And say, Father, what Bragbile is saying is too big to think. But I'm, I'm not going to t talk against it too. I don't believe, but I don't disbelieve. <laughs> Just stand in between somewhere like that. So that God can, can, can remember you. Praise the Lord. You will see greater things than this. You will see heaven open. And it is not about man. You will see Angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You will see. And they believed on him. His disciples believed on him. Last night, I mean the, the last, the last uh, uh, night vigil that we had to enter the new year. You remember that was my last charge to you. Abi, I charge you to believe God. I charge you that the spirit of faith said we having the same spirit of faith we believe therefore we speak. And I feel that as we are breaking forth into the year believe. Believe the Lord and believe his prophets and he shall be well with you. If you don't understand, tell God, open my understanding. But even if I cannot understand, Lord, I put my hand in your hand. Just lead me 
I trust you. I know you will not mislead me. God will not mislead you. God will not misguide you. God, who is committed to his word, will not misguide you. He has not misguided us. He will not misguide you. Even when we were trembling, we were saying, oh God, oh God, will anything come out of our lives? Everybody is talking. Everybody is against it. Everybody is saying, yeah, 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 yeah. God said, what are they saying? Follow me. And they believed on him. I stop and trust God that you are breaking for into this year, believing God. That you are doing whatever he tells you to do, believing him. And that you are praying because you believed in his power. And that you have joined the, the mother's company who will not take a no for an answer. Who will not agree and say my time has not come. Who is saying, stay there, stay there. That man is the answer to this problem. And they are praying because they believed. Lord, help us to believe you. I want to stand up with you in prayer. And I want you to stand with me in prayer. And I want you to stretch forth your heart with me in prayer. And I'm just going to ask you to join me to, to tell God. He said the word they had did not profit them because it did not mix with faith in their hearts. But for me, oh God, this will mix with faith in my heart. This will mix with faith in our heart. They could not enter your rest because of unbelief in their heart. But we believe to enter your rest. We believe to see your glory. We believe to see your power at work. We believe, oh God, to see another revival that will sweep the nations. We believe you, Lord, that all our churches and denominations, they will be swept with your power. All our pastors that have struggled for years, Lord, you will visit them again. All those who left their jobs to serve you, and the ground have become so hard under their feet. Lord, you will soak the land with the rain. And you will give them opportunities. Lord, some are saying, is it how I'm going to die? We prophesy to them, they will not die. You will not die, you will live. You will see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. In the name of Jesus.